we know there's just a lot going on, and we know that at all times our hearts need to be turned toward Jesus. So let's just pray for wisdom and direction in all things. Any other requests this morning? All right, then let's sing the song prayerfully, what a day that would be, and then we'll stand together and look to the Lord. <coughs> took flasks of oil, 
with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up, trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet. And the door was shut. Later the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your word this morning. We just pray that you will help us as we spend these few minutes looking at it together, that we would just be guided into a closer walk with you. Your holy name we do ask it. I remember going to the doctors several years ago. I think I was still in college. But after I got through, I think I went for a sinus infection. And he said, well, I just want to uh, run a few blood tests before you leave. You know, so I uh, walked from his office over to the lab. And after she went on a fishing expedition and finally found a vein, I said, uh, after the third and fourth tube was in process, and I said, what are you testing anyway? And she looked at me with a straight face and said, it's a blood test. And I thought, really? I thought you were taking a urine specimen from my arm or something. You know, I mean, it just doesn't work that way. But anyway, the problem was I didn't ask the right question. I needed to say, what are you testing my blood for? That was the real question that needed to be asked. But because I got the wrong, uh, you know, asked the wrong question, I didn't get the same answer. It's kind of like, you know, in uh, most of us, I think, remember algebra class when you get those wonderful uh, word problems, situation problems, where they tell you how to draw everything, and you make your equation from the word problems. Now, it is logic and it's simple, but you learn real quick, just because you make an equation and do all the math correctly, doesn't mean you have the right answer. You had to ask the right thing in order to put the right numbers in the equation. I share that because I think many times when we think about the return of Christ, we ask, the wrong question. I know there's been countless books on prophecy written, uh, countless movies, and by the way, I enjoy them. I love The Thief in the Night, and I love The Left Behind. The, you know, they're, they're good. But there's one thing they usually do. They are asking the questions, when and how. And the Bible doesn't really give us the when and the how, it tells us to be preparing for. And that's where we sometimes miss the mark. We can so busy, be so busy looking for the when and the how that we miss the preparing for, which is what we are called to do. I was reading a sermon by a, another pastor this week, and uh, he went so far as to say this passage almost doesn't sound like Jesus talking about a final judgment, but guess what? Judgment is part of justice. And therefore we know that much more is written about forgiveness and redemption, but we still are called to live our lives in preparation for the time that Jesus will be coming back to us again. Today's scripture lesson comes third in a collection of teachings that Jesus shared with his disciples about the time of the end. Of course, he first begins by saying, it's going to be like in the days of Noah. 
when the flood came on the earth, everyone was just going about their business. No one was paying attention to the crazy old man who was building a boat in the middle of the desert. They weren't listening to that. They were focused, going about all their routine. And even though Noah had shared with them and given the opportunity, no one paid any attention. However, the day the rain came, God's judgment was brought forth. God's mercy was on those who followed him in the ark. But those who were left outside, by their own choice, were too late. This was followed by a parable where of a master or of a servant becoming careless. Uh, at the end of chapter 24, there's the story where a man had gone into a far country and left his fields in charge of one of the servants that he had. And of course, he didn't tell the servant when he was going to be coming back, but when he came back, he found the servant not just taking care of the crops, but beating some of his fellow servants and uh, doing things which were totally contrary to which the master would have done. What was that? And then the master caught him, and it's like, oops, I shouldn't have done that. But guess what? His carelessness got him in trouble. Then we come to this story today which talks about a wedding. Now I realize there's many things about this wedding, you know, the culture and practices are a little different than ours, and yet there are some things that still remain the same. I've learned a long time ago in all the years of officiating at weddings, never schedule anything too tight either end of the wedding because there very likely will be some surprises. Either, yeah, let's see, one time we were waiting for a tie for the groom, okay, you know, that, that's one thing. Uh, one time we were waiting for the bride's father. One time we were waiting for a photographer who was stuck in traffic. Uh, and my all-time favorite was when the church was filled, the church comfortably seated about 150, it wasn't here. We had 225 people there, and the couple came and said, oh, we forgot the marriage license. So they had to send someone home and try to find where they had filed the marriage license. And, uh, you know, so. so anyway, I've learned you just, you got to be prepared for a little waiting. Well, and in this case, all of the bridesmaids should have known that the groom came when he was good and ready. And there could be other things he was taking care of. We, we don't know what the details were. But it says they waited so long that they'd even fallen asleep. Now I know sometimes we think, you know, fell asleep. That was not a good thing. No, sleeping is like going about our regular routine. I guess it wasn't the time I fell asleep at the sugar mill and the boss came in and tapped me on the shoulder when I was staring at the computer screen. Hey, it was 4 o'clock in the morning and watching the computer screen was boring. All that aside, however, these women should have known and been prepared for the time of waiting. It said 10 Five were wise, five were foolish. Five brought extra oil, five brought just enough for the immediate use. Well then when the announcement came that the bridegroom's coming, and now this isn't specifically spelled out in scripture, but tradition at the time was they would gather where the bridesmaids were, and there would be like a parade to go to the groom's house, and they would often take the longest route and make a lot of noise. I, I suppose this is where the blowing horns of that comes from for weddings in our culture. You know, you made a lot of noise to draw attention, and then everyone was supposed to come out and offer their blessings to the couple. And I suppose if anyone threw a gift in, that was okay too. But all that aside, um, 
when he came, the wise were ready for the trip. The foolish were not. They said, give us some of your oil. They said, now wait a minute. We can't give you our extra oil because then none of us will have enough. So what did they do? They'd go buy some. So I don't know whether they went to you know, 7-Eleven or wherever they went to buy stuff at that uh, time in history. But they went, they did purchase the oil, and they came back. But by the time they came back, the feast was underway. And the door was locked. And they couldn't get in. Now I know, I, I've been used to it, I said a lot of variables. I actually was an usher at a wedding one time. And uh, the pastor said, you close the sanctuary doors. It was a two o'clock wedding. You close the sanctuary door at two o'clock and anyone who comes in after two o'clock goes to the balcony. <laughs> they weren't allowed in. So I guess, I don't know, maybe he was taking this verse a little too literally. But whatever, they were not given entrance because the party was already going on, the celebration was taking place, and they were excluded because they weren't prepared. Many times, I think we need to remind ourselves, it's not so much the when and the how. In fact, I cringe whenever someone tries to make a specific date and says, Jesus is returning on this date. I've said so many times, I think God has enough of a sense of humor that he'd delay it a day just to prove that he was right, that no man knows the day nor the hour. But all that aside, there is much to be said for being ready when he returns. You see, we're not called to prepare for an event that's coming years in the future. But let's be honest, if the disciples of Jesus had known that the coming kingdom of God was going to be 2,000 years in their future, they may not have been as diligent about making other disciples as the gospel as they did. I think I know human nature well enough. When do we do things? We're governed by deadlines. Oh, I have so long to do this. But did you ever notice there's always, I could ask for a show of hands if everyone got all the jobs they wanted to get done this summer completed before the cold weather started. And I bet most of us would have to say, probably not. And there's a few will still be there next spring. That's okay. But when it comes, the church of Jesus Christ is called to be what? The salt of the earth, as Jesus put it in the Sermon on the Mount. We are to be the seasoning in the world. And that means we are living in a state of readiness because we're rejoicing in the presence of Jesus and we're sharing that with those around us. The real question we need to be asked is not when is Jesus coming, but how do we prepare while we are waiting? I think a little bit about the fire department. When the big siren blows over here on the corner of 4th Street, it catches everyone's attention. Why? because we know something unusual is happening. Now, I realize sometimes it's a sports team that won an event, and that's good too. But, you know, whatever, we know there's something special happening. No one knows when the alarm is going to be sounded, but when it's sounded, someone needs to be ready to go. That's why the firemen don't wait, whether it's volunteers like service here or whether, you know, paid like they are in the cities. Um, they don't wait until the alarm goes off to fill the truck with fuel and to make sure 
that the hoses are reeled in. Everything is ready to go so they can meet the need whenever it happens. And this is the way Jesus calls us to live in a state of readiness. First, by seeking forgiveness for the sins that we have committed. Uh, you know, it's not something that we have to pay for. It's not something that we have to take a steady course for. All we have to do is ask Him into our heart, and He will forgive our sins. And then from that point on, that doesn't mean, oh yes, well, my sins are forgiven, now I'm all taken care of. No, that is the beginning of a process of living for Jesus making a difference in the world that we come in contact with, sharing the love of Jesus with those around us, showing mercy and kindness to those who need it. We always need to be living in a state of readiness. I fear that sometimes, you know, when a few years ago there, were so much, there was so much emphasis on prophetic teaching in the church, that, you know, people were almost sure Jesus was coming the next day. Well, he hasn't come yet. That doesn't mean he's not coming. But there's also a danger of us becoming careless because we think he's delaying. I still remember when we were living in Sacramento, the man come on the weather report and he said, Now, the city needs to prepare. There are three major storms out in the Pacific, and they can hit us one, two, three, and they'll be flooding all over the community, and you know, they were... Well, the first storm came through, and we got a few showers, and you know, a few wet uh, sidewalks, and nothing more. And he comes on the weather that night again, and says, now, the first one didn't really hit us, but there's still two more. You need to be ready for this. Well, the second one came through the same way. And, uh, you know, a little bit of wind, a little bit of rain. So now, just because the first two storms didn't do anything, there's still another storm out of the Pacific heading our direction. Well, that one hit us. And I remember spending most of the evening out, we were managing an apartment complex at the time, and I spent most of the evening clearing rain gutters in the street to keep the water from coming into some of the apartments. Uh, a, a neighbor's car was stuck just trying, the water had risen high enough that his uh, car stalled, just trying to pull onto the main street. Uh, you know, it meant it. But by the time the third storm came, no one was listening. Oh yes, I remember it was a very interesting thing. We lived just a couple blocks from the levee, and you could look up and see boats. That's never a good thing when you can look up to boats from where you're walking. But you see, people got careless because the first two warnings didn't happen. We need to be living our lives in a state of readiness for the time that Jesus comes. That doesn't tell us that it's going to be next month, next year, or the next ten years. It tells us that we are to be ready. And are we living our lives in such a way that we're making preparation for Him and sharing His love with those around us? If not, find His forgiveness in your heart. And put our priorities such so we know that we are ready for the time that He calls. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your word this day. We pray that you will help us. As we are living in a time when there are uncertainties in the world around us, we know that our hope is securing you. May we spread that assurance and that love with those we come in contact with. The holy name we do ask it. Okay. All right, let's stand together and close our service with 
song so old we hardly ever use it anymore, but it's just kind of a fall song, and I think a good way to go into a Thanksgiving dinner when the roll is called up yonder. I might do 